Um, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the uh, blogosphere's influence on journalism. There's sure. been a lot, I guess we're up to like, I think six to 8,000 mm -hmm. um, journalist layoffs since yep. the summer, since the beginning of the summer. And I heard uh, some conversation about that and um, Chris Hedges, who used to uh, write for the New York Times, mm -hmm. he, he was saying that the blogosphere, kind of this anti-blogging argument that um, the blogosphere is kind of parasitic Mm. on um, print journalism, that most yep. people that write are just linking to some newspaper story. Um, and, and people are reading the blogs, but they're not buying the newspaper anymore. Mm. And it's a parasite that is, he was saying, it sort of eats its host and that most bloggers don't even pick up the phone to, to yep. you know, check a source. Or it's, it's, he's, he's saying it's competing with journalism, but it's not journalism and it's potentially threatening to journalism. Yeah. And I'm wondering um, I, how you'd respond to that yeah, I see it as symbiosis rather than parasitism. So, um, yes, you have bloggers, and I do this every day. I see a story in the Rutland Herald. Lewis Porter writes a great story. He's a great journalist. He digs deep, and he finds something. And then I'll, I'll riff on what he's doing. And it's not that I couldn't do something without him, but uh, what he's put out there is so worthy of passing on that I do that. And that's some value added on my part because right. I've, I've searched the world of news stories that day before my readers and I've said to them, look, here's a, here's a great piece by Lewis Porter. Um, the other thing in addition to, to riffing on journalist stories that's going on is journalists trolling the blogosphere for interesting material <laughs> because part of the reason why uh, readers have gravitated over the last 10 years to blogs is that the entertainment value is higher. And you can argue all day about whether entertainment and news and politics mm -hmm. should ever mix. I would say they mixed a long time ago. Right. And a paper or a television station or a radio station ignores that at their peril. Right. So um, for instance, I'll get calls from people at the Rutland Herald or the Free Press, and what they want is a fun take on something. And then they can report the blogs are saying this, mm -hmm. but in effect, it's allowing them to generate entertainment content also. Right. Then, then one more thing I would add, and that is, I think it's easy to get locked into the kind of micro story of journalism, mainstream journalism versus the blogs. What's really going on at the larger level is the sort of dismantling of certain three-dimensional structures. So I work at the University of Vermont and I can tell you at every college and university nationwide they're having exactly the same discussion that's going on in every journalism uh, newsroom nationwide. And that is how do we compete with the online version of us? Mm -hmm. So online courses and online degrees are no longer a fringe thing. You know the, the University of Phoenix and places like that that will offer you an MA or a BA at a fraction of the cost because they have no real infrastructure. Right. Or maybe two weeks a year they provide infrastructure. Sure. Um, how does a university in the traditional model deal with that? They deal with it by fielding more online courses. That means at some level you have to cut three-dimensional people. And, um, and you know, six people were just laid off at the free press. I look at those two things, the University of Vermont and the Burlington Free Press, and I see them coming to grips with 21st century technology, Eff effectively or not effectively, but the same problem. Okay, um, I I also think that because you 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 don't just link, mm -hmm. um, you generate um, new content when yep. you interview someone. Yep. And I'm wondering if you have sort of any favorite interviews you've done or, or standout um, ones of I guess state level politicians. Yeah, I did a, an interview with Pat Leahy and. Um, it's one of my favorite interviews. He talked in it about his response and his current feelings about the anthrax investigation. And which he, re he received an envelope, didn't he? Yes, he did. And, and, uh, and there were deaths associated with that. The postal workers. Right. Were... And, and in talking with him about it, he was very, you know, he felt very deeply about it, very passionately that the investigation wasn't going at the speed that he wanted. And he said a couple of things in that interview that went out into the world and when the 
scientist Ivans, who was suspected of being the, the anthrax mailer, killed himself just recently. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, everybody began revisiting everything on the web having to do with that. And right. that interview began to get more attention. And I've gone back and looked at it myself. And, and there are some really fascinating parts to it. The other one that I, that I did that uh, struck me in a totally different way was going back to the 2006 cycle. You had Peter Welch versus Martha Rainville. There was also a guy named Mark Shepard who was challenging Rainville in the Republican primary. Sort of from the right. Yep. And he was a guy, more or less unbeknownst to me, who was very anti-gay marriage. And I sort of knew that from my research, but I hadn't really foregrounded it. And he and I met for breakfast. And what I had planned as a 45-minute genial, sort of friendly, past the Tabasco sauce kind of interview turned into like he this. and I going head to head for about an hour and a half about whether gay marriage was a slippery slope to bestiality, the whole Rick Santorum mm -hmm. uh, political mode. Right. And that was the moment where I realized the difference between a blogger and a journalist. A journalist would have said, wow, this is really strange, and would have written the interview and nodded the whole time. And I felt like I couldn't do that. I had to engage and, and argue. Right. And, and maybe that's the difference between the objective journalist model and the blog. Right. Right. The blogs have perspective that is it's open. And you don't have to s sort of try to read between the lines and figure out which yep. facts are they selecting for me. It's, it's very clear. I'm selecting these facts to make this argument. Um, I guess that changes, mm -hmm. changes your role as an interviewer, too. Yeah, and people will sometimes contact me when I show a preference for one person or another in an election, which I do every election. That's, mm -hmm. that's why I have the blog. Right. Um, and I always make the analogy to my front lawn during election season. I put out you know, signs for the candidates that I support. I don't put out signs for people I oppose. And so I'll get an email from someone who will say, you owe your readers a post in support fair of... Fair and balanced. Fair and balanced. And I have to say, um, I like to think I'm fair, but I'm not balanced. Um, I, I vet the candidates myself. I decide who I like. And then I present, I think, a fair take on their worldview and on their opponent's worldview. But it's not balanced, necessarily. Right. And, and you know, some people have a difficult time with that because it is a form of advocacy, but, but completely unabashed advocacy. Okay. Now, you recently went, uh, quote unquote, legit in that you were blogging for the Burlington Free Press <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> at Denver. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering if that was any different at all, or you could just basically do what you do for Vermont Daily Briefing yep. through them, or were there parameters defined, or, or how, that, how that looked yep. to you, or would you sign up again? Or? I, I would sign up again. They were wonderful to work with. They were completely accepting of whatever I wanted to do. and. Uh, I would say that I realized I was writing for a larger, more inclusive audience. And so, you know, the sort of tone that I might adopt in my own blog was toned down just a notch. It was self-regulating. Yeah, not too much. But things that I saw in Denver that really struck my fancy, but that probably didn't get covered by the mainstream news media, I still saw fit to put in there, and they seemed to like it very much. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, Tuesday night of the convention, I'm sitting uh, in the front row because Howard Dean... <laughs> got you good seats. Yeah, he, he got us great seats. <laughs> Did you see where the uh, Vermont delegation was at the Republican yeah. convention? And, and in 2004, they were up in the nosebleed seats with, uh, with Americans abroad. Oh. You know, so you went past you know, the Virgin Islands, and then you got to the Vermont <laughs> seat. 